Good morning. morning. We're reading from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 through 26, page 1788 in your Pew Bible. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you, Shirley. Good morning. A few things to bring your attention before I get into the message. By the way, we'll be in John chapter 12, verse 27 to 36 today. So if you want to go ahead and and have that place prepared in scripture, that would be great. Uh, A couple things. Remember, we have the the, the, the grief share starting tomorrow night, 6 p.m. here at the church. And some of you have been involved in that. Uh, Maybe some of you need to be. It's just a wonderful real group. I've heard so many good things from this group. I thank you for Jim and Shirley's leadership. If you want to know more, just talk to them. Shirley just read uh, about Grief Share. It's an incredible ministry that might really bless you if you're going through grief or loss of some kind. But it starts tomorrow. I also want to let you know that the t-shirts are still on sale. Uh, And again, $10 from every shirt goes to uh, a, a scholarship fund to help people going towards Hope Learning Center or Agape Christian Academy Uh, some sort of Christian education alternative. So if that's something you're interested in, uh, t-shirts look wonderful. There's different colors. There's, uh, I I actually wore one last week and was going to wear one this week, but I had a couple of people concerned about me wearing jeans. So, Hey, that's okay. I didn't do it this week, but, uh, the t-shirts are, are, are great. And so if if you you check out, there's a table back there at the end, uh, at the end of the service for you to look at. Uh, also we have baptisms on June 11th, which is next Sunday, and August 13th. We have a couple baptisms next week in the second service. If you need to be baptized, please talk to me about that. Call the church office. August 13th is going to be in connection with the church picnic. Uh, Just to let you know about that. And a couple other things to let you know about uh, is, one is is Senate Bill 5599. There's a referendum. Uh, We have a signature table back there for that. Uh, as well as another one um, dealing with parent parental rights. And if you'd be willing to sign that, uh, if that's something you desire, understand that Senate Bill 5599 is evil. It's an attack on the family. It's one that at 13 years of age or older, someone can run to to a place and run away from home and have quote unquote gender affirming care, which can give them chemical castration or physical changes, uh, surgeries to their body without parental support or approval. Uh, and it's also, um, I, I've, I've been doing a lot of reading. I guess it has implications for those under 13 as well. So know that it is uh, an important bill. I think that it's, it's, uh, it's already passed. It's currently law. Uh, and so what we're doing with the referendum is we're trying to get up to the vote of the people in November. That's what we're really trying to do. And so we need 200,000 signatures statewide. I hope you'll consider signing that. You know, I, a lot of people say, don't be too political or anything. There are some things that are directly against God's word. So God's word says we're created in his image, all right? And, and, and it also tells us to honor our parents. And it says the parents are the foundation, not the state. And so I can take a direct course from scripture to what, how we should respond to this particular situation. So I make that very clear. Sometimes we do things because scripture tells us, gives us a moral duty and this is one of those where we have a moral duty to interact on behalf of families, on behalf of parents, and on behalf of children. Uh, you know, someone who's 13 years old who might be confused. I don't know how many of you might have been confused when you were 13. Things change as you go through puberty. It doesn't even give a chance to do that at this point. It just goes in and makes permanent changes that they will change their lives forever. And personally, I think that it should go to the parents, not to the state, to make decisions on behalf of their children. How many of you agree with that? All right, so 
So we have that petition being signed. Uh, if you're willing to sign that, it's a, it's a, there's a table in the back for that as well. Along those lines, tonight is youth night. Uh, every first Sunday of the month, we do something we call Freedom Night in America, which focuses on an issue in our culture. And tonight, we actually have our youth speaking about their experiences. We have a, a, a small panel of students who will be sharing and sharing about their experience in, in the school and how we can support them and come alongside them. And so that's tonight at 6.30. I highly encourage you, if you don't have anything to do tonight, consider doing that for, to support them, to hear what's going on, to hear what we can do to help them and bless them. So I hope you consider that tonight as well. And the last thing, I know I have a lot of stuff. The last thing is we have an associate pastor candidate coming in June 25th. His name's Brett Chapman. His wife's name is Debbie. Uh, they're going to be here. He's going to be preaching. He's going to be uh, sharing his testimony. He's going to be, uh, afterwards, we're going to have like a, a luncheon or something, some sort of get together where you can ask questions. I'm also trying to organize something for Saturday. Uh, we'll, we'll give you information on that. But we'll be taking a vote that day on him to be the associate pastor. And you'll be able to vote from after the first service on through the afternoon. We'll figure out. We still have a lot to work on as far as the system and everything that we're doing in that. But, but we want you to know about that. We'll be giving you more information. That's happening Obviously, uh, the search committee, the elders, and the staff uh, have uh, agreed and, and kind of have been unanimous in feeling that this person is the person that, has, that, that uh, God has led here for that role. And so we want you to meet him and see why we think that and get your feedback as well. So that's happening on June 24th, that Saturday, and the 25th. Um, having said all of those things, it's a lot of stuff. I'm going to pray for us before we get into the message. Father, I want to thank you for today. I thank you for a church body that understands the seriousness of the times that we are in. We want to be aware of the times that we are in. Uh, Father, from all indication, it seems like we're on the doorstep of a tribulation that is soon to begin and a rapture could happen any moment. But Father, we don't know the timing. You do. We know what we're called to do. And Father, I pray that we would be found defending children, defending families, defending parents, and what you've called them to do and giving them, Father, anytime someone's desiring to hurt them in any way, that we would be salt and light that's standing against the darkness of our culture. Give us courage to do that at every turn. Uh, Father, I pray for Youth Night tonight to bless you and to bless those students and to really help us to think as a church body through some of these difficult issues. Uh, Father, I, I thank you for calling Brett here, uh, Brett Chapman. I, I pray that, Lord, that you would confirm if that is your will, that you would confirm that he is indeed the person for the church body. I thank you for those children who went downstairs uh, to our youth or to our children's ministry and those teachers. Bless them, Father. All the teachers are so important. The kids are so important. The battle is for our children right now in our culture. And we need to not only understand that, but to act on it, Lord. And we know that. And I pray for Diana Suverly, who right now is in Hungary and uh, is serving you in her mission trip. And I pray that you give her energy. I pray that you give her good sleep at night. I pray that she bond well with her team. And I pray that you'd use her in a mighty way and encourage her heart while she's far from home. Remind us to pray for her. And I pray for this time as we look at your word. Open the truth of your word to us. Uh, Father, let, it, let us take it in and let it sink deeply into our hearts and our souls so that we would Respond to your word in a way that pleases you and glorifies you and draws us near to you. We lift all these things up, things up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. One of golf's most interesting moments came when a Scotchman demonstrated the new game to President Ulysses S. Grant. Carefully placing the ball on the tee, he took a big, mighty swing. The club hit the turf and scattered dirt all over the president's beard and surrounding vicinity while the ball remained resting on the tee. He had missed. Again, the Scotchman took a big swing and again he missed. Our president waited patiently through six tries and then quietly stated, there seems to be a fair amount of exercise in the game, but I failed to see the purpose of the ball. <laughs> we need to know our purpose and seek to accomplish our purpose. Our purpose at Bethel Community Church is to help people become faithful followers of Jesus. We want to live with purpose in mind so we don't waste life that the, that the life that Jesus has given to us. We want to be, just be taking a series of swings and misses. Jesus modeled a life with purpose better than anyone else I can think of. 
Jesus lived and died with a purpose in mind. That purpose was so that others, including you and me, could be in relationship with him for eternity. Last time we were in the book of John, we saw Jesus responding to the desire of Gentiles to meet with him. They desired to meet with him, and his response was to point to the work of the cross and what it accomplishes for all people. We also saw him call his followers to exemplify the same lifestyle in our selfless service and sacrifice. Now, in our passage today, we see Jesus, Jesus continuing to discuss the importance of his death on our behalf, a death with a very specific purpose. So in John 12, verse 27 to 33, and again, I invite you to turn there with me if you haven't already. Jesus speaking says, now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice from, came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there heard it and said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is a time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. Now Jesus begins by explaining the reason for his death. It had a very specific reason, a very specific purpose. But understand that death is no friend of Jesus. He's troubled by his upcoming death and probably especially troubled by taking on the wrath of the Father for you and for me. But we need to understand that death is an enemy that Jesus needed to defeat. He understood his purpose. In John 11, verse 32 to 33, from the chapter before, the one we're looking in today, it says, before raising Lazarus from the dead here, it says, when Mary reached a place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Martha said very something very similar. Basically, they understood that in the presence of Jesus, death would flee. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. The word for deeply moved here means to be greatly agitated, to be angered, to be indignant. It means to be moved by anger. Well, what was Jesus angry at? Is he angry at Martha? Is he angry at Mary? Is he angry at Lazarus for dying? Is he angry at the, the, those who are grieving? Well, I believe he's angry with death itself and the consequences of our sin. Sin and death were enemies that needed to be defeated. In John 11, verse 38 to 39, just a little later in that John 11 passage, it says, Jesus once more deeply moved, or again, it's the same word, angered, indignant, the idea moved by anger. Moved by anger, he came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. You know, I don't think he said, you know, take away the stone. I think he was angry. He's angry with death. He's deeply moved by anger. And he says, take away the stone. He's about to roll up his sleeves and do some serious business. Because death is not his friend. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22 to 26, in the passage Shirley read from just a little bit ago, it says, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. In Adam, the one thing we have in common is that we have death. But in Christ, those who follow Christ, who place their faith in Christ, we have resurrection. But each in turn, Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. We want to belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. Being, talking about the spiritual realm. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. Notice the last enemy to be destroyed. It's defeated now, but the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Notice that it is also his enemy. Death is his enemy. It is now defeated and it will be destroyed. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54 to 57, it says, When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. What a bold statement. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, legend has it that on June 18th, 1815, the French under the command of Napoleon were fighting the Allies, the British, the Dutch, and the Germans, under the command of Wellington in the famous Battle of Waterloo. As legend has it, the people of England depended on a system of semaphore signals to find out how the battle was going. One of these signal stations was on the tower of a cathedral. 
Late in the day, it read in large letters, Wellington defeated. Wellington defeated. Just then a huge fog came in and they couldn't see the sign anymore. And word started getting out that they had lost this very important battle and people were discouraged and depressed because they understood the significance of what had taken place with Wellington being defeated. Suddenly the fog lifted and the remainder of the message could be read. It contained four words, not two. The total message was Wellington defeated the enemy. There's a big difference, isn't there? between Wellington defeated and Wellington defeated the enemy. The news spread quickly as gloom and despair were turned into joy and celebration. Well, God has a way of turning defeat into victory, and we must never forget that. In Genesis 3, the deceit of Satan and the sin of man was turned into a promise of a savior. In Exodus, the pursuit of Pharaoh was turned into a mighty escape, a mighty deliverance. The grave was turned into a resurrection, and the finality of death was turned into eternal life. Jesus has defeated the enemy. Do we understand the significance of this truth? If we understand the significance of this truth, it will change us. It will draw us. It will compel us. It will seize us. Do you understand the significance of the cross? You know, we come in here and we celebrate communion. and we, Well, we should because we're celebrating the cross and what it accomplished. We have symbols like the cross that's behind me. When we look at that, have we gotten to the point where we just see that as a symbol or do we understand its significance? Are you a believer who goes through life day in and day out and, 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 and now you've just kind of become desensitized to the significance of what has taken place and what has been done for you? I want to let you know the cross has seized me. The blood of Jesus has seized me and I am not the same. And we must fight that pull of the world that draws us away from the significance of what has taken place on our behalf. Now to defeat death, he received the wrath of his father in our place for our sin. In John 12, verse 27 to 28, Jesus prayed, now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason. This was his purpose. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. In other words, Father, have your will. John's gospel does not include Jesus' struggle in the Garden of Gethsemane as the other gospels do. And this may be John's way of sharing Jesus' turmoil. He does so by sharing this exchange with the crowds that exposed his turmoil even before he went to the garden. When Jesus says, my soul is troubled, the word for troubled is terasso. It means to agitate, to terrify, referring to acute emotional distress. Jesus isn't like, yeah, I'm a little troubled by this. He is, it has pierced his soul. It, it goes down to the depths of who he is. He is troubled. He is terrified in his spirit over what is going to take place. Yet Jesus would submit to his father's will. He said, no, it was for this very reason. I came to this hour. Father, here we have a prayer, submitting his will. Glorify your name. And this is very similar to what we see in the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew 26, verse 39. It says, going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus is obedient to the father, glorifying his name. In verse 28 of our passage, he prays for his father's name to be glorified through him. But understand, for that to happen, Jesus must endure not only the pain of the cross, but the emotional pain of receiving the weight of our sin as the Father pours his wrath out on him for our sin. He took the penalty that we should. This was a horrifying and yet sacred moment. All Jesus had ever heard, you think about the relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit from eternity past, before there was time. I can't even understand that. But they have always existed in a relationship where the Father has said, this is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. We see statements like that in the New Testament. He's pleased with the Father. Or the Father's pleased with, he's pleased with the Father. Jesus pleased with the Father. And the Father's pleased with him. We have this close, intimate relationship in the Trinity, in the triune God. But here in this moment in time, when he takes on the wrath for our sin, that's not what happens. Instead, he takes the wrath. This is really kind of a horror story lived out by God in the flesh. In Matthew 27, verse 45 to 46, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Ali, Ali, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's a quote from Psalm 22, one, but it's a whole lot more. It's really happening. 
And in that moment, it's not just that the father is turning his back on the son, not looking at him. No, the son is receiving the wrath of the father for your sin and for mine. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, it says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, literally a sin offering for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In Isaiah 53, verse 4 to 6, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for, in our place, for our transgressions. He was crushed for, in our place, our iniquities. The punishment, the wrath that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him, there's that wrath again, has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now the Father's response is seen in verse 28, when it says, then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I and will glorify it again. The Father is glorified in the death, the resurrection, and the exaltation of his Son. Jesus' death brings glory to the Father's name, and Jesus models what is required of us. We are to glorify his name by living for him and surrendering to his will, just as Jesus did. In Matthew 5, 14 to 16, it says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and notice, glorify your Father in heaven. We are to glorify him just as Jesus did. Now, according to verse 30 of our passage, the voice from heaven is for our benefit. It is the realization that God is at work. It's what God is doing. The result of Jesus' death is the defeat of Satan's work by drawing all people to himself. The door for salvation is now wide open because of Jesus and because of Jesus alone and what he has done. Sin, death, and Satan are, de are now defeated enemies and their destruction is assured. In John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and life. No one, notice no one comes to the Father except through me. There's a lot of things that we hear out here. I'm even hearing some in Christendom about how Jesus is a way. No, Jesus is the way. He made it very clear. He is the only way. It's what he said. No one comes to the Father except through him. If anyone else has a different message, it's wrong. It's not biblical. It's not truth. In Acts 4.12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. In 1 John 3, verse 8, the reason the Son of God appeared, notice, was to destroy the devil's work. In Colossians 2, verse 13 to 15, when you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. I'm so glad it doesn't say some of our sins. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, again, the spiritual battle that is there, he made a public, public spectacle of them. Notice, triumphing over them by the cross. Jesus knew how he would die. He would be lifted up on a cross. And the cross is not a symbol of defeat. The cross is a symbol of victory. He triumphed over his enemies by the cross. Being lifted up refers to the cross very clearly. It refers to his death on the cross in our passage, but may also be foreshadowing the resurrection and exaltation of Jesus. Jesus knew how he would die, and Jesus knew why he would die. He would die to draw all people to himself, not just to the Jews, but all people of all time without distinction. This is the ultimate answer given to those Gentiles in verse 20 and 21 of chapter 12 who were seeking to see Jesus. And he said, oh yeah, you can see me. I'm gonna open the door. We talked about that last week, but it's gonna take my death on a cross. It's gonna open that door for all people to come without distinction. Jesus' actions motivated by love would draw people to himself. The word for draw also means to pull or persuade. The cross persuades me. It has had a huge impact on my life. It has radically changed my life. It draws me to Jesus over and over again. It, it moves me to, to want to embrace Jesus. And isn't the cross beautiful in what it signifies? Does it draw you? Are you drawn by the cross? Because if not, something is wrong. You need to meditate upon the cross once again and understand its significance. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14 to 15, it says, for Christ's love compels us. This word compels, can mean to take hold of us, all right, to, to take 
custody of us. It has the idea of, of someone being forced between guards that must be propelled forward. It seizes us. Christ's love seizes us, compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who, should, who live should no longer live for themselves, but him, for him who died for them and was raised again. He dies for us, we live for him. You know, there was a time in my life as a young believer that Jesus dis- disappointed me and I was very angry with him. And I've shared about some of that before. I thought he did not love me personally and he went out of his way to show me that he did. And when I fully grasped this truth, when I really understood that truth, it changed the entire course of my life. I believe it's why I'm in ministry today. I walked into a study one night in anger, mad at God and mad at the world. I left all in. I remember leaving saying, all I have, whatever you want, I am now yours because I know you love me and I know you went to the cross for me and I have applied it. I applied it personally and it was like, I am all in. Well, what changed? I understood. I really began to grasp his love for me and it was compelling. It drew me. His love compelled me and drew me in like a riptide that I could not escape. You know, this, this last week I had my my big toenail removed on my right toe. It's already been removed in my left toe. I have an issue where it happened on my left toe. You know, you, I, I have some sort of injury and then it comes off and then it comes back, but it doesn't adhere well and it comes off again. Well, it happened to my left foot, so I did it with my right toe, my right toe as well, my big toe. And so I went to the doctor and they had it taken off and they put a acid on it so it won't grow back. So it takes care of the problem. So I have a funky looking nail on both sides now. Uh, but when I, when I, when I left, they, they bandaged it up and everything else. It was kind of a bloody mess. And uh, I, I, I went home, and as I was going home, I went in my car and I had to stop at Walmart to get Epsom salt and different things, and they have to soak it and all those, those wonderful things. And I got out of the car, and I looked down, and I was horrified to see just a puddle of blood where my, where my toe was. Just, now, here's what upset me. I was wearing my favorite sandals with memory foam. foam. <laughs> they're not really expensive, but they're my favorite sandals. And I remember looking down. Most people would have been freaking out because of the puddle of blood. I was like, my sandal! My sandal is ruined. It was just, the memory foam just took all that blood. And I remember I came back here and after cleaning up the wound a little bit, I was like, instantly I was more worried about my sandal. Angela can attest to this. She saw me going through this. At the, yeah. and, I, and, I, and I was cleaning off as much as, as I could. And so I didn't get it all out though. It's like, my sandal's ruined. I was really depressed about that. And someone told me, they said, well, use hydrogen peroxide. Because hydrogen tr- peroxide draws the blood out. And I went home and I did that and it worked. It worked really well. And I was really glad about that. It's like, my sandal is saved. Well, in a similar way, Jesus' blood draws us. It draws us to him. When we understand the significance of what he has done, his work on the cross, which demonstrates his love for us. And when we get that and we understand that and we grasp that, it becomes the most important thing and it will compel us. It will drive us. It It will change the formation of our entire lives. Have you been drawn to the blood of Christ. have been drawn to his love demonstrated by that great sacrifice. You know, my prayer for all of you is stated really well in Ephesians 3, 17 to 19. Apostle Paul's prayer for the Ephesians. I pray it for you. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, rooted and established, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp, to really seize, to get a hold of, How wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. So that, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Because he'll seize you and you'll be you'll be controlled and you'll be compelled. And so I pray that you know that love, you begin to grasp that love and that love drives you. We don't wanna be driven by like legalistic checking boxes or whatever it might be. We don't wanna be driven by that. We wanna be driven and compelled by the love of Christ. We wanna be driven and compelled. We want his love to compel us. Not his rules, but his love. The idea in the Ephesians 3 passage is that literally we, the church, would become like Christ, who is the fullness of God in our love. Without love, we cannot become like Christ. We must grasp and apply his love for us to fully love others like he does. Now, the crowds that were present misunderstood their great need, and that can still be a problem today. People don't understand the seriousness of sin. And one thing I think that keeps us from having the cross compel us and and, and drive us and for us to be drawn into Jesus is because we think our sin isn't that bad. Maybe, Maybe you don't need the cross. 
Maybe we'll just be fine on your own. Maybe we'll stand before Jesus and say, you know, I'm a pretty good person, don't you agree? And Jesus said, oh yeah, you're awesome. I, I, you, didn't, you didn't need the cross. You're the exception. No, you're not. You need the cross. In John 12, 34, it says, the crowd spoke up. We have heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? So they understand that Jesus claimed to be the Messiah. They understand that's what's at stake. And they understand somehow that Jesus is talking about going away, death in some way. They're, they're starting to get this understanding. Wait, wait a minute, time out. The Messiah is supposed to come and he's supposed to reign forever and ever. They're expecting something different from the Messiah that, than what Jesus was postulating. And, and we see what they were thinking in some messianic passages, like Daniel 7, verse 13 to 14. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. Somehow he's God, but he's not God the Father. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. So that, this is a messianic passage. His dominion is, notice, an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. They say, hey, wait a minute. It's an everlasting dominion. It will not pass away. And his king was one that will never be destroyed. They're thinking Messiah's going to come. He's going to rule forever. And it's never going to be an end to his reign. In Psalm 110, verse 4, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. And again, another messianic passage. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. It's like, Jesus, what don't you understand about forever? In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. They're expecting a forever king and a forever kingdom. Why would the Messiah die? Why would he go away? He's going to come. He's going to reign forever. What they did not understand is that their greatest enemy was not Rome. Their greatest enemy was within. It's sin. It's death. It's Satan. And their greatest need was a savior. And that's what Jesus came to do. And they were not looking at the entire prophetic record of the Messiah in scripture. Because if they did, they would have figured out in places like Isaiah 53. In the context of the passage, some of the passages I just read. Yes, he's going to die for your sin. He's going to raise and he's going to come back. That is there in the Old Testament. But they were only looking at what they wanted to look at. And you know, it's much more attractive than saying, we want Rome defeated. Would you defeat Rome and then reign forever and let us reign with you? And that's what they wanted. And Jesus said, there is a problem with that. You have a sin problem. You think your enemy is Rome. Your enemy lives within you. And I've come to do battle against that enemy. And they didn't understand that. We can still misunderstand what God is doing and become disillusioned and disappointed with God. And that is why we are called to trust him. Sometimes things that don't make sense only make sense through the lens of faith. Is Jesus trustworthy? Even if we don't understand what he's doing. You won't understand what he's doing, but can you trust him? Can you trust his plan? Can you trust the greater plan? Oswald Smith was a Canadian pastor, an author, and a missions advocate, a man of prayer. You read a story, the guy prayed a lot. In 1920, he was standing before an examining board who was selecting candidates for foreign missions. And his one passion as a, as a teenager, as a young man, was to go and serve God in the mission field. He wanted to be a missionary and take the gospel so badly. That's what he felt called to do. It's all he wanted to do. Over and over again, he prayed, Lord, I want to go as a missionary for you. Open a door of service for me. Now at last, his prayer would be answered before this board. However, they, when the examination was over, the board turned Oswald Smith down. He did not meet their qualifications. He had failed the test and he was devastated. Oswald Smith had had his mind set up. He had his heart set on being a missionary and now life had thrown him a curve. What would he do? Well, as Oswald Smith prayed, and again, a man of prayer, God planted another idea in his heart. If he could not go as a missionary, he would build a church which could send out missionaries. And that's exactly what he did. In 1928, Smith founded and pastored a church in Toronto, Canada, which sent out more missionaries than any other church at that time. Oswald Smith trusted God, and the Lord transformed his disappointment into a greater work than Smith could have ever imagined. God had something bigger, something better in mind. No, your giftedness is going to send out not just you, it's going to send out many. He had a greater, bigger plan than what Smith had in mind. Can we trust his plan? Jesus still calls us to trust him and his plan. In John 12, verse 35 to 36, and Jesus told them, you are going to have the light just a little while longer. Wait a minute, the Messiah is supposed to come and reign forever, and you're saying you're only going to be here for a little while longer? 
I don't like that plan. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. By the way, seizes, apprehends, takes possession of you. That's what it says about the darkness here. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. Believe in the light while you have the light so that you may become children of the light. When he had finished speaking, notice Jesus left and hid himself from them. That's his plan? Go away? Hide yourself? That doesn't sound like a good plan. You know, the world is a dark place. You may have noticed the darkness. People desperately need Jesus. They don't know where they're going and they're stumbling around in darkness. Jesus is the light. He was telling people in our pastors they should take advantage of his light while he is there with them on this earth. His plan was to die, resurrect, and ascend and send the Holy Spirit. That was his plan. It's a great plan. It's not the plan these people saw, but it was an incredible plan. The light of Jesus is still available today because he died and he did that. And the world is in need and so are you. Even if you're a follower of Jesus, the enemy is trying to distract you and take you captive. He's trying to take you captive by hollow and deceptive philosophies that are out there. They'll, they'll have you put your energy and your mind on those things rather than on Christ. Matter of fact, Colossians 2.8 says that. In verse 6 and 7, it says that it's talking to the church. And it says, so this is talking to believers. See to it that no one takes you captive. You can be taken captive. Through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition, the elemental spiritual forces of this world, notice rather than on Christ. You know, I think the church in a lot of places are being taken captive. I read different things about different churches, and I just read about another seminary that was going into, you know, they're heavily into Pride Month or heavily into all these things. They're going all in, and, and it's like they're, they're going away from the gospel to go, this is what the world tells us we should do, and they're, they're going into that. They're, they're, they're believing the lie, and they're, de- they're depending on philosophy of this world and, and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather instead of Christ. No, Christ is the foundation. Christ is always the foundation. Keep your eyes on Christ. Fix your eyes on Jesus. And if anything tells you to go differently or gives a different gospel, that's false. If anyone gives you any hope outside of Jesus, they are giving you a false hope. We need to remain in the light and then shine that light. John 8, 12, it says, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me, notice not just believes in me, but follows me. We should follow him. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. We must follow after Jesus. In John 16, Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me, those are very, two very important words. Sometimes we skip over the really important words. Sometimes they're small. The in me is very important here. I have told you these things so that in me, you may have peace. You're not gonna have peace outside of him. As believers, we think sometimes we just can't have peace because we're Christians. No, you need to remain in him and follow him and seek after him. Let him be the foundation so that in me you may have peace. In this world you have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. We can become so discouraged. I can. I can become very discouraged and depressed when I see what's on the news and I see where the direction things are going. Take heart, Jesus says. Remain in him because he has overcome the world. Jesus left after this interaction with the crowds and it is the end of his public ministry in the book of John. He's still going to minister to his disciples and we're going to see that over the next several chapters. But his interaction with the crowds will now only come in the context of them yelling, crucify. He is preparing to do battle with sin, death, and Satan at the cross and the window for their response is closing. So is ours. So believers, stay connected. Remain in the light. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you or seizes you or takes possession of your life. It's better to grasp God's love and be compelled by that than to be compelled by darkness. Don't let the enemy distract you and drag you away from the light of Jesus. And for those of you who are my brothers and sisters here who are dearly loved by me and by God, Foundation is Jesus, must always be Jesus, always the truth of his word, always the truth of the gospel. Don't let anything sway you from that. And we must fix our eyes on Jesus at all times. He must be what compels and drives us because it is his blood that draws us. It is that which draws us in. It is that love that draws us into him. And that's what I want for each and every one of us. So let's make sure that we never go astray from that basic, most important truth. Now, if you're here or watching online and you've yet to put your faith in Jesus, you've yet to receive him as your savior, it's critically important that you do because your time is closing. We don't know how much time we have. 
We don't know when we're going to be hit by a truck when we cross the street. We don't know if the rapture is going to take place at any moment. We don't know how much time we have. If you have been drawn by Jesus and you see who he is and the cross has drawn you, do not resist him. Receive him as your savior. God created us to be in a relationship with him. That's what he wants, close and intimate relationship. All right, Genesis chapter one and two tell us that we were created to be in a relationship with him, but we have a problem, we have a sin problem. And our sin has separated us from this intimate relationship that we were created to have. And sin is, is, is not gonna be removed by human effort. There's nothing you or I can do. It's not like we can say to Jesus, you know, I'm good all on my own. I don't need the cross. Jesus says, no, yes, you do. I went to that cross for you because it's your only hope. And I love you and I want you to take this hope that I've freely given to you. It took the blood, let the blood draw you. Paying the price for our sin as our advocate in our place. Jesus died on that cross and he rose again. That everyone who puts their faith and trust in him has eternal life. Life that begins now and lasts forever. Which is a really long time. If you've yet to personally invite Jesus as your savior, please don't resist him. If he's drawing you, please respond to him. I'm going to pray in closing here as, as I always do and give an opportunity to respond as I often say it's not my prayer that is it's it's you trusting in Jesus and receiving what Jesus has done in your place and trusting in that alone instead of anything else prayer is just one way to communicate with God the desire to receive that truth so you, if it's your desire to to do that right now please do please pray along with me if the Holy Spirit prompts you do not resist him Pray along with me in your heart right now. Jesus, thank you for dying in my place for my sin on the cross. Thank you for shedding your precious blood for me. I'm a sinner. I have fallen short of your perfect standard. And I need a savior. You are that savior. I need you. I turn from things that I've trusted in to be good enough in your sight. And Jesus, I trust in your work on the cross alone. I trust you alone for my salvation. I receive you as my savior. And I trust you that today I am your child and I always will be. You will indwell me with the Holy Spirit and help me to walk in relationship with you. Thank you for this salvation. I pray in your name, the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen.